Yeah, I think that should work out pretty well for our quail cage. Uh, be one more thing that we can uh, put meat on the table. Oh, hey guys, welcome back to the Hands-On Channel. I'm glad you stopped by. You know, I've been thinking a lot here lately as I'm building out my quail cage and I'm, you know, uh, increasing my rabbit herd. Uh, we've got, we've actually got 12 kits right now uh, out there uh, nursing on the mama still, but uh, those will be meat in our freezer in the future. We've also got chickens. We've got, you know, for egg laying and stuff like that, but we could uh, use those for meat production. And as I'm thinking about all the different things we're doing here in our suburb backyard, uh, and I would argue you could do this in a city backyard for the most part, maybe not the chickens uh, because they're noisy, but rabbits and quail, I bet you could get away with that in the city. So anyway, as I'm thinking about all this different stuff, I'm thinking about how many new people are coming into the fold right now and becoming preppers. Uh, they've never prepped before, but they're seeing the writing on the wall, whether that be the potential for economic collapse, uh, the potential for EMP, uh, it's never been greater. The potential for World War III spilling over into the continental United States. I mean, we could see war here in the United States. And so I think that's bringing a lot of people in. Also, the revelations that are coming out that the government has been lying all along about the COVID, about everything about the COVID. Everything the people that were so-called conspiracy theorists said turned out to be freaking true. So. I know if you're anything like me, when you see these things, you're like, okay, it's time to double down on my preps. And today we're not going to talk about uh, what type of things you should be stocking up on. We're going to talk about like seven different skills that you should have and you should work on right now before everything collapses, before SHTF gets here. And that hourglass is running out of sand, so you better get off your butt and get out there and start making things happen because daddy government ain't coming to save you when everything collapses. So number one on my list, gardening and foraging. You need to learn about gardening and foraging. If you've never done a backyard garden, I suggest getting into some raised beds. Go out and get some literature, some books, uh, you know, do some research online. See what grows in your area the best and plant those things. Uh, almost every state in the United States you can grow potatoes so I would recommend potatoes number one they put a lot of food in your belly so and they store well for long term if you store them in the right conditions but get into some potatoes get into some tomatoes whatever you can grow there on your property corn whatever grow it this year is it you have to have a garden this year if you want to survive what could be coming and you know I don't have a crystal ball I don't know when it's going to happen, but I feel the tension building and building and building. And eventually it's going to break the dam and the water is going to come rushing in. And if you're not prepared, if you don't already have a lifeboat set up, you're going to starve. The government ain't going to be able to save you. Even if they wanted to, they're not going to be able to save you. Uh, so gardening and foraging. Again, foraging, you're going to have to get some books on your local area. What kind of things grow in your area here in my area? Uh, we've got dandelion, we've got uh, morel mushrooms, we've got uh, cattail, believe it or not, uh, prickly pear, uh, uh, cactus. There are lots of things that you can gather and will keep you alive. They're not going to be the best tasting meal. It's not going to be like eating a filet mignon steak or something. It's going to be like foraging for food. So it's not going to be the best, but it's better than eating a leather shoe or something like that or starving to death. So know these things right now increase your knowledge in gardening and foraging before it's too late next up we've already talked about it a little bit here backyard livestock uh, one thing that my wife and i have learned over the years gardens can be hit and miss i mean you might have a year where you've got severe drought conditions and you just can't possibly put enough water on those plants to keep them alive uh, you know the 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 rain as you can hear right now falling uh, is the best way to water your garden. I don't know what it is. I don't know if there's nutrients in the rain or what, but I've noticed when I'm watering with well water versus rainwater, the growth rate is a lot higher when it's rainwater. So obviously rain is the best thing, but if you have a severe drought season uh, or a summer that gets brutally hot or whatever, triple digit temperatures, not a lot of plants like to thrive in those sorts of conditions. So it could be hit and miss with gardening. One thing that's easier to deal with if you're a meat eater like myself and my wife 
is growing your own backyard livestock. So, like I said, we're getting into quail right now. We've got an incubator going in there with two dozen eggs in there. I can't wait to fill these up and start putting quail meat on the table. Uh, for one thing, I've never eaten one, I'll be honest with you. I've eaten Cornish game hens and other small birds like that, but I've never eaten quail. But from what I hear, it's delicious. Uh, we've got the rabbits. Like I said, we've got uh, a dozen uh, grow outs right now. Actually, uh, 15. I've got 15 of them. I've got three of them that are ready to slaughter right now and 12 of them that are in the nesting boxes still nursing on mama. So that's going to be meat in our freezer. All right, great. The rain dropped down so I don't have to yell at you guys. Uh, anyway, chicken eggs, things like that. Get into some backyard livestock. Learn everything you can about that livestock right now, how to keep it alive. Get all the infrastructure you're going to need, the, the cages, the, the watering bottles, the feeders, everything you're going to need. Get that worked out right now and it would be a good idea to buy duplicates of everything in case the system collapses. Then you'll have these things in the future so that you can continue to feed your family. Next up, know how to get water. This is a huge one. I mean, really more important than food is the ability to get water. How are you going to get it? If you have a well like I have here, there are ways to run a well off of a generator. So if it was an EMP and all the power went bad, you could actually hook your generator up to the well and just run the well and maybe pump that up into a 55 gallon drum or uh, fill up your bathtubs in the house or you know maybe you've got a 375, is it 375 or 275 gallon IBC tote that you could fill up, that you knew was clean, that you could fill up with clean drinking water. Now, if you're gonna be storing water like that, you need to know about a few things. Like, if you leave one of those uh, semi-clear IBC totes out in the sun, guess what? Algae will start forming inside of there. And it could get to a level where it make you and your family sick. So, uh, my plan is, is when, sh when SHTF happens, I could move my IBC tote in here into the shop building where it would be out of the sun, I'd be able to fill it up with water and I'm uphill of my house here so I should be able to gravity feed down to my house. Now it's not going to be high pressure. It's not going to be the same pressure that you have now to fill up your toilet bowls and take a, take a nice shower or anything like that. It's just going to probably be a trickle when it comes out of that hose there at the end. But because I'm on a septic system here, I would be able to fill up the back of my toilet bowls and still use my toilets inside. Also drinking water and you know cleaning water cooking water things like that know how to get water if you're in the city uh everything's stacked against you because you're on that city water system and as soon as they cut the power to that then it's over you'll have whatever's in your house whatever's in your toilet bowl you'll have whatever's in your hot water tank but other than that you won't have any water so you'll have to go out and find water and dealing with water and carrying water is a big deal. So I recommend if you're living in an urban area and you can't escape right now before the SHTF happens, get a lot of buckets, get a lot of different things that you're gonna be able to carry water with because you're gonna be doing a whole lot of that. Water is critical to life. So make sure you know how to get it and know how to uh, clean it and filter it and purify it and make sure you're not drinking something that's gonna give you dysentery or something like that which used to be one of the number one killers in the United States back when we were settling in the frontier days and stuff like that. Dysentery was a killer and it was mainly because of not drinking clean water, getting little bacterias and bugs and things that you pick up out of this water from a stream or whatnot. So know how to deal with that. Don't make yourself sick. Don't die of thirst. It'd be a terrible way to go. Next up, weapons and fighting. And I'm gonna add another one physical fitness. You need to be in good shape before the SHTF happens. But as far as uh, fighting, you know, we're just talking hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, know how to hold your own, know how to get into a scrap and not get your ass kicked. It's going to be really important because at that point, after SHTF happens, it's a matter of life and death. Every fight, every uh, skirmish you get into is a matter of life and death and your survival. So it'd be a good idea to know how to do some hand-to-hand -hand combat, have some melee weapons, have some different knives and cutting weapons and things like that uh, in case you run out of ammo. But number one, guns, lots of guns and ammo, lots of ammo. You're going to need it to defend your preps, to de defend your chickens, to defend your homestead, your quail, whatever. When people start starving, if they think you have something, they're going to come and take it from you unless you 
defend your property, defend yourself, defend your livelihood. At that point, if someone's trying to steal from you, uh, your food especially, that is a threat against your livelihood, your life, your family, your homestead. So have weapons, know how to use them. Uh, as you guys have seen before, uh, if you watch my videos, you follow my channel here, I like uh, pretty large knives, I like kukris, I like uh, buoy knives, I like things like that, machetes, different things like that that have a little bit more reach to them. That way if you reach out and have to stab somebody uh, or something, you've got a little bit more reach. And also like with a buoy knife, you've got that great slashing ability, I mean just things to have. As far as uh, guns that I highly recommend, try to get things that everybody else has. So in the United States of America, I would say, Glock 17, Glock 19 in 9 millimeter, and the reason you want 9 millimeter is because it's a NATO round, and it's been in the United States for years and years and years, and almost everybody that shoots has 9 millimeter and has a pile of 9 millimeter ammo in their gun safe or whatever. So, get things that if something happens, maybe in the future something happens and you break your Glock or something, if you can find another Glock and take parts out of that, you'll be able to get back. Uh, shooting again you know you'll be able to defend yourself again so I highly recommend the Glock 17 uh, or the Glock 19 just whichever size you like I personally like the 17 I like a full-size pistol and if it were me I'd be stocking up on those 33s if you know what I'm saying I can't talk too much about that because I don't know what YouTube's new rules are about guns uh, but the 33s you'll you'll know what I'm talking about if you know uh, if not, you need to go do some research on the Glock. It's a great weapon system. I don't know if it's still the same way today, but years ago, I remember when I bought my Glock, over half of the police uh, in the United States of America carried Glock 17s or 19s. So that's a good thing. If everybody's got the same thing, then when you get in trouble and you need a part, you'll be able to go out and get that part, right? Uh, the other thing is, pick out an AR-15, or maybe you like AK-47s. Either one is fine. I personally like the AR-15. Uh, it's a more precise machine. It's more accurate, uh, although that precision comes at a cost. It's not as rugged as the AK-47 as far as like getting it full of dirt and mud and things like that. Uh, an AR-15 can jam up or, or get locked up with, with gunk and sand and dust and stuff like that, where that AK-47, it'll just keep on going from what I'm told. Now, you lose a little bit of accuracy there in my opinion, they're not as, not as nice to shoot. When you shoot an AK, uh, the times I've shot AKs, I put it up to my shoulder, I pull the trigger, and I swear it sounds like the thing is coming apart inside of the, inside of the gun there. So an AR-15 is not like that. It's a highly tuned machine. Uh, you don't have to worry about it blowing up in your face or whatever. Not to say that an AK would blow up in your face, but it's just one of those deals where every time I've shot an AK, it sounds like clack, clack, you know, and I'm like, man, is this thing fixing to fall apart or what, but it's just the way they are. Their uh, tolerances are pretty loose and that is what makes them able to shoot uh, in worse conditions than an, AK, than an AR-15. So uh, if you're worried about being out in the mud in the, in the crud and stuff like that, then you should probably lean toward the AK platform. Uh, if not, uh, then you should go with the AR-15. I personally like the AR-15 and I just know that it has limitations. I'm gonna make sure that when I'm out crawling around in the dirt and the mud that I'm not laying my gun down in the mud with the, with the action open or whatever to where it could get filled up with dirt and mud. But yeah, I recommend something in nine millimeter, probably a Glock or a SIG and an AR-15. Your choice, whatever you want. The Smith & Wesson is a nice one. Uh, there's a lot of really nice ones out there. Everybody makes one. Just take your pick and try to get one that's mil spec so if something happens in the future, you'll be able to get parts off of one of your neighbor's guns or something like that once they're dying of starvation or thirst or whatever they didn't prepare for. Uh, next up, comms and knowledge of how to operate communications. So we've done videos before in the past about how we have a MERS frequency, M-U-R-S frequency here. Uh, that's our handheld walkie-talkie type radios. We also have a couple of those Baofeng uh, little handheld ham radios. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not the, the most knowledgeable about that sort of stuff, so that's one of the things that I need to increase my knowledge base on and maybe even print a few things out because you can't remember what all those buttons do. But whenever 
SHTF happens, that's going to replace the cell phone. You're going to have to have some way to communicate with people and know what's going on around you. And I highly recommend doing a lot of research and deciding what's best for you and your area. But get a couple of those Baofeng radios for, if nothing else, you and your wife could have one where you can communicate uh, up to, you know, three to five miles away from each other. That is a game changer, especially if you have to you know, go out and, and do recons and different things like that, just securing your property, uh, being able to call back and tell your wife, hey, uh, you know, we couldn't hold the line, they're coming, be ready, you know, whatever it may be, having that little bit of communication, that, that, that head start over the other people that are coming in and take stuff away from you could be the difference between keeping your stuff or having all your stuff stolen and then starving to death, which doesn't sound like a good deal to me, but... Uh, you need to develop like your instincts about people. Uh, you know, this is a tough one because people can be very tricky. You know, they'll tell you all the pleasantries and niceties and things that you want to hear because people know how to do that. So you have to be able to read through the BS, you know, and there's an old saying, you can't BS a BSer, right? And there's some truth to that. So know and recognize the signs, develop your instincts about what people's intentions are. And again, it's life and death. If you're trying to go out and trade with someone and you show your hand, uh, you say, oh look, I've got all this stuff to trade. And they, you know, maybe they pretend like they're good people or whatever and want to do trading with you. But what you don't know is when they leave to go get their supplies or whatever, they're going to get their buddies to come back and steal all your stuff. So. Develop your instincts about how to judge people, uh, what they're going to do, how, you know, how they're, and I know that's, that's a tough one. That's just life experience. Uh, looking people in the eye when they're talking to you, stuff like that. Knowing the signs of when someone is lying out their ass because they're going to be doing it. If they're starving to death and they're driven by hunger pains, they're going to say whatever they have to say to convince you that they're not bad. So just... I don't know. My advice to you is if you don't already know them, if they're not already in your group, uh, proceed with extreme caution. Anybody you deal with outside of your group or your family, extreme caution needs to be applied. So just, you know, keep your, keep your, keep your mind right, man. I mean, when this stuff starts going off, you're going to see the worst of people immediately. The worst of people. People you thought would never steal from you or hurt you or harm you in any way will rob you blind if they think they can save their family or give them one more meal for their family. So just be ready, be ready. Last one on the list here is mechanical skills. I mean, once the SHTF happens, you're gonna need to be able to fix your own stuff. Like I was talking about earlier, I can run my well on a generator as long as I have fuel and as long as my generator runs. What if my generator breaks down? I know how to fix my generator for the most part uh, everything that's come across uh, my table so far, I've been able to fix it. Uh, but what if something happens and you need a special part? Do you know how to make that part? Do you have the tools and the knowledge to repair your own equipment? That's a big deal. That could be the difference between life and death. I mean, you guys that follow the channel, you know I've got tractors, I've got motorcycles, I've got all kinds of different stuff that aren't necessarily for uh, SHTF prepping they're more for like farming and the motorcycles are more for fun but during SHTF that little Honda you, you guys can't see it because it's back here behind my coupe here but uh, that little red Honda uh, 250 that I've got it gets 80 miles a gallon uh, it's it should be safe from an EMP because it doesn't have any electronic stuff or, on it or any computer chips or anything like that so all I need to do is be able to keep that thing running and have plenty of fuel because that could become my number one mode of transportation when I'm running around after the collapse happens. So mechanical skills are going to be very important. Uh, being able to fix your Jenny, being able to fix your motorcycle, being able to fix your truck or whatever on your own without the help or aid of anyone else. And also being able to think outside of the box. Maybe, maybe your, uh, your main fan belt goes bad on your truck or something, right? If you break a belt, right? And I know on a lot of these modern vehicles, it's, it's serpentine belt, so this may be harder to do, but if you've got an older vehicle with the V-belts, you can actually make a belt, uh, you know, a belt 
out of rope if you have to, to get you by. Is it the best thing? Are you gonna be able to drive 100,000 miles on that rope belt? No, but it might just get you home. You know, uh, another one is that, that I've had to do this myself before. If you develop a water leak, like say somebody is shooting at you and they shoot through your radiator and suddenly your water is leaking out of your radiator. Well, guess what? If that system is pressurized, it leaks out a lot faster. So one little trick you could do is take the radiator cap off. I mean, obviously make sure the vehicle's cooled down so you don't get scalding hot water sprayed all over the top of you. But you could take that radiator cap off or crack it loose to where it doesn't build up pressure and that will buy you some time to get you, you know, get back to your homestead or wherever you're trying to go. I mean, another one, I remember this from, uh, 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 what's the show called? Uh, Red Dawn, the Wolverines, that, you know, they had a similar situation. Their old Chevy truck, it developed a leak in the radiator. I don't know if it was shot or what, I can't remember, but it developed a leak and guess what they did? They got up there and peed in it because all it has to be is liquid. So in a survival situation, you could pee in that radiator and get you down the road or pour some soda pop in there if that's what you got or some water inside your cab. But just make sure you have those mechanical skills and be, become a MacGyver. Uh, maybe that's dating me a little bit here, you know, and showing my age. But, you know, if you watch the show MacGyver growing up, uh, I can't remember that guy's name, the, the main actor, but he was also in Stargate later. Uh, but that guy would take like a, you know, a bubble gum wrapper and, you know, whatever, and make something work, right? Get, it, get himself out of a sticky situation because he had the skills, the mechanical skills to do that. You know, that reminds me of another story. Back in high school, uh, I had this old 72 Monte Carlo and it would blow certain fuses. I don't remember which fuse, but it would blow certain fuses all the time. Well, one time it blew this fuse and I was way out in the middle of nowhere and I took a piece of aluminum foil and wrapped it around that glass fuse and stuck it in there. And guess what? It got me home. It got me home. It got me enough time to where I could go to the parts store and buy a whole pack of those little glass fuses. So that way I wouldn't have to do that again. But having that kind of knowledge could save your life one day. Uh, so guys, let me know down in the comments, what other skills should we all be working on right now to avoid death and starvation and dying of thirst? And you know, I mean, little things like even getting infections and things like that. So I didn't even go into medical stuff, but you're gonna need to be able to take care of anything that normally you might go to the doctor for or the mechanic or call a, call a technician in to come work on something. You need to be able to do it yourself. That's the key to survival. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. What are you working on on your homestead to try to increase your chances of survival, your family's chances of survival? Uh, we're all in this together, at least for now. I think when SHTF really does happen, you're gonna see so many people turn on each other, it's gonna be unreal. So prepare yourself mentally, physically, spiritually for what's about to come. We all feel it. If you're watching this video, especially this far in, you know it's coming just like I do. So uh, follow your gut instincts. When you feel something ominous is on the horizon like this, a storm is definitely upon us. And when you feel that coming, batten down the hatches, prepare yourself. It doesn't mean you're one of these weirdos from like doomsday preppers that's, you know, whatever, thinking the Anunnaki are coming back to get you or whatever. It's not like that. You're just, it's just basically stocking up on the stuff that you already have and developing your skills so that in case you need them in the future, you'll have them. Once that internet goes down, man, I'm telling you, and the cell phones go dead, people are going to freak the hell out. And they're going to start starving. They're going to start thinking about, hey, how am I going to get my next meal? And they're going to start looking to the suburbs and to the countryside. So have a plan to defend your stuff because, again, at that point, it's life and death. Anyway, guys, appreciate you tuning in. As always, I stand for liberty. I hope you do too.